Hello booktube, my name is Elizabeth. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, Book as in Books. In this video, I want to talk about translations and more specifically, when does a translation stop being a translation and starts being an adaptation? And the, the book that sort of prompted this reflection for me, it's not so much a book because this is a book, but it's a big book. Um, it's a play. Uh, so this is the Greek plays, new translations, uh, by, edited by these two people and translated by a whole bunch of other people, including these two, but also other translators. And the one play that I read more than one, but the one play that sparked this reflection for me is Antigone by Sophocles, which is in this book. Uh, so in this book, we have uh, a translation of uh, Antigone. Uh, I'm going to start by a bit summarizing what the story of Antigone is because it's going to be uh, helpful for later on in this video. I d don't script my videos, but I know a little bit where I'm going with this, I think, I hope. Uh, so uh, it would be useful to know a little bit of what the story of Antigone is. Uh, so you probably know what the story of Oedipus the king is. Uh, it is uh, famously this man who married his mother after having killed his father, even though he didn't know that it was his father he had killed at the time and he didn't know that it was his mother that he was marrying at the time so uh, for a long time they just lived together thinking that everything was fine and then one day they discover that Oedipus is his wife's son and that uh, their children are both the children of Oedipus and the brothers and sisters of Oedipus which is quite creepy so what happens at the end of that story is that Jocasta hangs herself and uh, Oedipus blinds himself and exiles himself and the children are left orphaned in the kingdom. Uh, so among the children, there is Antigone, who is one of the daughters of uh, Oedipus and Jocasta. Uh, there are also, there's also another daughter who is uh, Ismene. I've checked on YouTube the way of pronouncing that name and I found so many ways of pronouncing it. I think the accent is on the second syllable, but I'm not sure, but I'm going to go for that. So Ismene. So uh, there are these two sisters and they play a big role in the play Antigone. And there are also two brothers. Um, they don't become king, well, well, the eldest one does not become king right away because they are just young children at the time when uh, Oedipus is exiled. So what happens is that uh, Jocasta's brother, Creon, becomes somewhat ruler of the kingdom until the two sons become of age. And then the rule was supposed to be that one son reigns one year and then is replaced by the other one. Of course, what happened is that the one who had the power did not want to give it up. So the second son decided to start a war against the eldest and they both died on the battlefield. And that is where we find ourselves at the beginning of the play Antigone. Um, so given that the two sons are dead and that women cannot rule, I guess, in ancient Greece, uh, it means that it is Creon who becomes the king of Thebes, who becomes the ruler, the absolute ruler, the tyrant, I guess, because he's not officially um, a descendant of the former king. So uh, it's not quite a usurper, but um, he's a tyrant uh, in the Greek sense of the word. And Antigone is a citizen like the others, a more important one, but a citizen like the others, and she must submit to the rules, to the decrees of the king. And the new king has decided that the eldest brother would be buried with all honors, and that the youngest one, who was the, rib the rebel, the one who, who threatened the order of the kingdom, would be left to rot on the field and would not get um, burial rites. And Antigone decides that this is wrong because, of course, it was very, very wrong at the time. And she decides that she will try to bury her brother. And that is what happens. But the thing is, the decree of the king, it says that anybody who tries to do that will be killed, forfeits their lives. And Antigone knows that. So this is the tragedy of Antigone who decided against the, the wishes, against the, the orders of her uncle, of the king, to bury her younger brother, even though technically he was an outlaw. So that's the story of Antigone. And how do I know that this is a story of Antigone? I read it, or rather, I read a translation because I don't read ancient Greek. I have to rely on a translation. And this is the translation I relied on. And this one comes with a whole lot of rules. There's a preface in the book and it says basically what the editors asked of the translators. And they asked a whole lot of things. So first, uh, this little paragraph that says a lot about the general tone of the translations. 
Translations of Greek tragedy have proliferated in recent years, and many styles are available today, some of which depart far from the Greek originals in an effort to avoid foreignness or to capture the feel of modern poetry. Our translators, by contrast, have tried to preserve some of the foreignness of the original without making the text opaque or obscure. They avoid colloquialism, using instead a more formal style to give some impression of the elevated, non-natural feel of the Greek. So already in tone, they are telling their translators, don't be too familiar. The original one was not written in familiar words, so don't use a too familiar tone to write your translations. Next rule. In addition to staying close to the diction of the original plays, we have tried both visually and metrically to give our readers some idea of their variations in rhythm, even though we can at best offer only an approximation. Lines that in Greek use the standard meter of speech and dialogue, iambic trimeter, are here rendered as iambic pentameter and run to the, oh, and then there's a little words on the presentation, but that is uh, not relevant to this conversation. The more complex lyrics meters typically used for choral odes and highly emotional areas by individual characters are in this volume rendered with various non-iambic rhythms. It has not been possible to correlate English meters with Greek ones, and the lack of such correlations is a serious loss to students of Greek tragedy. But in the footnotes, the translators have tried to give some sense of metrical variations and the shifts in mood or changes of dance step they indicate. So uh, obviously, it says that English poetry cannot be like Greek poetry. Okay, fine, I understand that. But they decided to translate to use in their translation what is the most common form of poetry in English, which is iambic pentameter, uh, because the Greek ones used the most common used uh, Greek poetry form, which is uh, iambic trimeter. Um, so it just, they adapt the rule, but the rule is in essence the same. You use what comes most naturally to your language. And they also say that when it's not possible, there will be footnotes to indicate whatever change happens and to tell you in Greek something happens here, but I cannot really render it in English. And finally, last rule. Finally, we have given our translators and ourselves the stern task of keeping to the lineation of the Greek text in these English versions, rather than expanding them as most recent editions have done. So they are promising us a translation that will respect line for line what the ancient Greek text was. Now, of course, there we don't have an original ancient Greek papyrus or something like that. Uh, they have been transcribed and transcribed and transcribed, and they have to use more than one manuscript probably to try to get back to the original as close as possible. But once they have established that original text, they try to stick with the original as much as possible, line by line, respecting some sort of meter that is as common in English as it was common, the most common meter in English, because it was, in the Greek, the most common that was used, and the same tone. And basically, they try to give us as much as possible an idea of what the original was. Uh, for me, because I don't speak ancient Greek, nobody speaks it, I guess, because I don't read ancient Greek, uh, and because I probably never will, this is as close as I will ever get to an original text. So, uh, what does this original text say for Antigone? I'm not going to read to you the entire play. I'm just going to read the beginning. So, it starts with Antigone and her sister, Ismene, having a conversation. Did I say that I don't know how to pronounce Ismene? Yes, I said that. Um, I'm doing my best. <laughs> so uh, it starts with that name, just to help me. If I knew English better, I would be able to guess how it's pronounced by the meter, but that's the thing. I have a hard time recognizing meter in English verse, so I don't know where the accent is in this name. Um, but, so. Ismene, my sister, my own dear sister, what evil left behind by Oedipus will Zeus, Zeus not bring to pass while we still live? There's nothing painful, no disaster, no shame, no dishonor that I do not see among the troubles that beset us now. And I'm not going to continue. I'm just going to say that this is the beginning. And as you can see, it's a conversation between the two sisters about 
about the decree that their uncle has just decreed, uh, the fact that they are not allowed to bury their brother, their younger brother. And they discuss how awful it is and what they can do about it. And basically Antigone says, I will bury him. And the sister says, no, 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 it's too dangerous. I'm not doing anything like that. So that's basically what's being said. And the conversation between just these two goes on for a few pages more. Um, before I started reading that, I read the introduction that comes with that play, because in this book, every play comes with an introduction. And it says that Antigone is one of the most uh, most often staged play of ancient Greece in modern times, uh, most often staged in modern times among the Greek ancient plays. And it mentions in particular a famous production by Jean Anouilh in 1944. And I thought, darn, I know that. I know that play. And it's not so much that it was a production of Sophocles' Antigone. It was a rewriting of Antigone. Because I remember we studied it in high school. And in high school, we did not study foreign literature. We studied French literature, literature written in French. And if we study Jean Anouilh, it's because what he wrote is part of French literature. It's not a translation. So I was curious about it and I went to the bookstore and ta-da! <laughs> I bought the little book, Jean Anouilh. And as you can see, there's absolutely no mention of Sophocles on the cover. And in French, it's a, normally, if it's a translation, you don't have the name of a translator. So you wouldn't have Jean Anouilh, you would have Sophocles, and perhaps translated by Jean Anouilh, or more often it would be written in the first page. But in the first page, again, absolutely no mention of the ancient Greek play, playwright. So there's no Sophocles mention. So how close is it to the original? That's the first page. I know you don't speak French, but I can't... I, I'm sure you can recognize that uh, there is no word Antigone written there to start the play. So it starts with a few um, directions, I guess. So a neutral decor, neutral background, uh, three similar doors, the, the curtain rises, all the characters are on the stage. They chit chat, they knit, they play cards. And then the prologue, the narrator steps forward. Here. These characters will play to you the story of Antigone. Antigone is the little skinny one sitting back there who is saying nothing. She is looking straight ahead. She is thinking. And she is thinking that she is about to be Antigone. That she will rise suddenly out of this skinny, black hair, introverted little girl uh, that nobody took seriously in the family. And she will stand alone facing the world alone facing Creon, her uncle, who is the king. She is thinking that she's going to die, that she's young, and that she too would have liked to live. But there's nothing to do. She, her name is Antigone, and she will have to play her role until the end. And it goes on like this. Uh, that, by the way, that was my own translation as I went. Uh, if you read a translation of Anui, it's probably going to be better than this. But the, the prologue, the, the narration continues until the first character appears four pages later, and that is the nurse. Is there any mention of a nurse in the original Greek? No, there isn't. And then instead of starting with the scene between two sisters, it's between Antigone and her nurse. And the sister appears only at page 21, right here. So obviously, this is not a translation, this is an adaptation. And also the fact that later they mention cigarettes, uh, I think there are phone calls mentioned, and um, club, d dancing in clubs and things like that. So obviously this is set in 1940 something, it is not set in ancient Greece, and it is an adaptation. And I think that makes it quite clear. And then uh, later in this introduction, um, it says, it, it ends, it's a short introduction that is three pages long, and the very last paragraph says, In modern times, Antigone has been among the most widely read and staged of Greek plays, and it has recently been adapted into new verse dramas by two great modern poets, Shemis Heaney, The Burial at Thebes in 2004, and Anne Carson, Antigone Nick in 2012. So, I went to the library because they didn't have it in bookstores and they are expensive. This one is way above $30. So I found these two books. So this is The Burial at Thebes. And if you look at the little characters there, it says Sophocles Antigone, translated by Shemis Haney. So even though it's Haney's name that is the biggest, 
it says that it's a translation from Sophocles. And here we have this weird title, Antigonic, and it says Sophocles. And it's only at the bottom here that we have translated by Anne Carson, illustrated by Bianca Stone. So these two books claim to be translations on the cover. Uh, however, the translator here does not agree. He says they are adaptations. Let's look. So what do we have here to begin with? The scene is Thebes in front of Creon's palace, just as the dawn is breaking. Antigone and Ismene enter hastily. So we are starting indeed with Antigone and Ismene having a conversation. And I realize that I'm saying Ismene in I don't know how many ways. Um, so it starts here with the same name as in this. So if we consider this as being as close as possible to the original, how close? does this become? Ismene, quick, come here! So already we don't have this official tone, we have a very familiar tone. What's to become of us? Why are we always the ones? There's nothing, sister, nothing Zeus hasn't put us through, just because we are who we are, the daughters of Oedipus, and because we are his daughters, we took what came, Ismene, in public and in private, hurt and humiliation, but this I cannot take. And she continues a little bit and then her sister comes in. So obviously this is still set in ancient Greece because we uh, have mentions of Zeus and it's the conversation between two sisters. So that the proportions are not kept. Uh, that's the one thing, the main difference. The, it's not a line by line translation, but it stays relatively close to the original in the type of characters. The, the characters in this book are the exact same characters as in this one. Um, there are no new characters, um, there's no new plot line. I forgot to mention that in this one. There is one major difference. The story is relatively the same. Um, as it says at the beginning, it is about Antigone who will try to bury her younger brother, even though the king has decided that it was illegal to do that. The one big difference in this book is that Antigone is given a choice. After the king learns what Antigone has done, he has the guard who came to tattletale on Antigone, say, we, we caught the person, it's her, it's her, and here we go, it's Antigone. He, he locks up the guard and he says to Antigone, I'll have him killed, and you just say nothing and everything will be fine. So basically, he's trying to have Antigone change her mind. And Antigone says, no, I knew what I did when I tried to bury my brother, I will suffer the consequences. It was wrong not to bury my brother, and I will not think that it's right just to save my life. So in this book, Antigone is given a choice, as in the original one, the choice is made. It's, it's sort of a, the tragedy of fate. She has decided to bury her brother, she will suffer the consequences. The choice was already made. Here, she is given a choice. Uh, Creon, I guess, is a bit more devious in a way. Uh, he accepts that there are perhaps two rules, one for the powerful and one for the weak, uh, for the ordinary people. And uh, he tries to convince Antigone to be complicit in his regime of what can be considered terror. Because, of course, this was uh, staged for the first time in 1944, uh, when uh, France was under occupation by the Nazis. So there is a subtext in this play that was probably not in this one. Uh, so Creon in this book is a lot less legitimate as a ruler than in this one. So this is another aspect of adaptation is that um, it, the, the storyline is not the same. In this, the storyline stays pretty much the same. Uh, the vocabulary is very different. It is made more familiar, I guess. Uh, it is in modern poetry. But it follows relatively closely the action of the original. So is this a translation or an adaptation? I would think it's still an adaptation. Uh, if they, the authors, not the authors, the editor, probably the author too, but if the editors decided to publish this under the name The Burial at Thebes rather than Antigone, it's because they knew that it was not a translation and that uh, purists, I guess, or not even purists, just straight ordinary readers would not buy that this is a translation. This is an adaptation. And finally, our last translation. Already, again, we have a weird title a little bit, Antigonic. So it's not Antigone, it's Antigonic. The first page we have is the cast. And the cast is recognizable as being pretty much the same one as in the 
but I'm going to keep calling the original. Um, the, the one difference is Nick, a mute part, always on stage. He measures things. So when you read it, you cannot really see what Nick is doing. I suppose you would have to, to see it to, to, to realize what he's doing. But he's always there, somewhere in the background. So this is the first page. So already the presentation is not so much that of a play as that of a, I don't know what. It, it looks handwritten, so it's almost like a graphic novel, except that uh, there's no graphics in this. Well, there are drawings, illustrations. I'll show you the illustrations a bit later. So it says, enter Antigone and Ismaimi. So it starts with a conversation between the two sisters. Antigone, we begin in the dark and birth is the death of us. So quite different from, come my sister, uh, I have something to tell you. Ismini, who said that? Antigone, Hegel. Ismini, sounds more like Beckett. Antigone, he was paraphrasing Hegel. Ismini, I don't think so. Antigone, whoever it was, whoever we are, dear sister, ever since we were born from the evils of Oedipus, spelled a bit weirdly, um, O-I-D-I-P-O-U-S. What bitterness, pain, disgust, disgrace, or moral shock have we been spared? And knowing this edict, you've heard the edict. Ismini, I've heard of no edict. That our two brothers are dead by one another's head and the Argyle army gone from the city is all I know. So in a way, it does cover the same ground as the first two, the, the first two, um, two, 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 replique. Uh, the first two interventions by uh, Antigone and her sister in the original. Uh, it's uh, Antigone calling her sister and telling her, do you know what happens? And the sister says, well, we lost our two brothers, but beyond that, I don't know. And then uh, Antigone confirms that there's been an edict and we're not allowed to bury our youngest brother. But Hegel, uh, another name that I don't know how to pronounce. Oh gosh, that's difficult. H-E-G-E-L. And then Beckett. And... Obviously, this is not a translation. This is full of references to 20th century literature. A bit later, there was a reference to uh, a Mrs. Ah, what's her name? Uh, Mrs. Into the Lighthouse. What's the name of the character? I knew it three seconds ago. I'll write it down in the uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, th that she died in parenthesis. Uh, and the thing is, I had just read To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. And if you had not read To the Lighthouse, you could not get uh, the, the idea of that um, uh, of that that joke. You couldn't, you couldn't get the reference in there. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Ramsey, finally. Yes, it's Mrs. Ramsey who died between parentheses. And it was a reference to Virginia Woolf. So uh, this book is full of references like that to other works of literature and to 20th century and 19th century and earlier than that. Um, and the, the drawings, I'm going to show you a few of them. Um, we have this, and of course it's on transparent paper, so we don't always see it very well. Uh, like this, I think you can see it more. And we can see it better against the, the back page, but then we see the back of the illustration. We don't see the real, the, the front of it. Uh, sometimes it's like this. And then this. So this is a beautiful book that can probably be read on several levels. It's a bit expensive, though. It was uh, $29.99 at the time, so I suppose that today it's even more expensive. And this is probably US dollars anyway, so in Canadian dollars. Oh, maybe not, Anne Carson is Canadian. So maybe it's Canadian dollars. Uh, but anyway, um, the, the, all of this to say that this is not a translation. Here, whoever wrote that is lying to your face. This is not a translation at all. This is an adaptation. I guess that this would be the part where I would try to, uh, if this was an academic uh, video, where I would try to find some some criteria that would definitely delineate translation from adaptation. Uh, but this video is long enough and anyway, I haven't thought it out. Uh, I just wanted to present three versions of the same, well, four versions of the same story. So with the the translation, this is definitely a translation, this is as close as we can get to the original, which is, when you think about it, that's the point of a translation. It's to get the reader as close as, po as possible to the original that the reader cannot read. And this here 
is it a translation or is it an adaptation? I think it's an adaptation uh, because some scenes are lost, uh, some words are lost. Uh, the point is not to give us, to get us closer to Sophocles. The point is, is to give us Seamus Haney's idea of Sophocles. So I think if the translator is more important than the original writer, and on this cover it says so, the name Seamus Haney is written much in much bigger character than Sophocles. Um, yeah, then Sophocles here. Uh, so, so it kind of shows that this is not about Sophocles. This is about Seamus Heaney. So I think this is an adaptation. And if this is an adaptation, then these here are definitely adaptations. So I don't know where to draw the line. If you know where to draw the line, let me know in the comments. And thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video. À la prochaine!